Cool. Okay. So yeah. So okay. So we're gonna talk about. Um, so today's thing is gonna be on. Was it section twenty-two? Is that right? Is that number right? Yeah, it's Tuesday, huh? So uh, section twenty-two. So I think I can't remember the title of it, but basically, uh, I think it's like. Uh, basically, we're gonna use naive Bayes and Bayes classification. Um, one kind of head up, heads up for this section because um, as you guys kind of go through it, um, the section has a lot of mathematics and it can be, you know, honestly very intimidating being like, whoa, there's so much going on and different notation um, reading through it. Um, I would say the big part of it is that kind of to reassure you is that one, to actually do the procedure, like to do, for example, we'll do classification um, and we'll talk about what that is in a second, but um, you don't need to have to call those formulas from like memory. You don't need to say, oh, what is this specific formula right here? Um, what's nice is that you can, of course, you know, uh, research that part, like, you know, look it up basically, or um, more likely is that there'll be a package that built in so you don't have to call that specific function. Um, now saying that though, that doesn't mean you should just ignore all the math and like, you know, just get to the, you know, the coding part. Um, the reason why we talk about the math too is that it helps you know, first of all, how these algorithms work, but also it helps you develop your own. And then the third part is a little more subtle and more like the future kind of when you become a professional data scientist is that as you, like, as you, the, the field's always evolving, new techniques are being evolved, or like, um, created algorithms, more machine learning algorithms and stuff. And these are done just through basically like scientific papers. Like people will write papers on this and the papers will have the math because we wanna make sure those actually work. They're not just someone said, well, I tried this thing and it worked out this way. We want something more formal, more clear and everything like that. So that's something um, as, you, as you're getting becoming into a more professional data scientist, you're gonna end up reading more papers. You're gonna end up looking at more technical stuff. And it's important to at least be familiar with, um, what's it called? More familiar with the, the notation, more familiar with like the way things are phrased, like with respect to um, such that and those kind of things. Um, you'll see those kind of like terminology and just the way it's structured. It's kind of like when you, um, when you look at like the Python or Pandas documentation, it's just a different kind of like language in a sense. It's not hard necessarily, but it's just kind of, a, you gotta wrap your brain in a slightly different way. So kind of just a heads up. But um, today I'm actually not gonna go through the whole math. I'm not even gonna go through much of any of the code really. Um, my goal for you guys today um, is to basically show you Bayes theorem and show you naive Bayes, um, which is you know an application of Bayes theorem to do a classifier. And so that way when you're doing the code, when you're reading the math, you can at least think in the back of your mind, like, what am I actually doing? It's like, how does this relate to what I'm doing? Because it's really easy to just like, for example, Google, you know, naive Bayes classifier and, um, you know, like uh, with scikit-learn and you can find the code and probably like copy most of that code and paste it in. But then understanding what you just did might not be as clear. And so it's important, I, I think it's important that we kind of talk about like, hey, what is this, you know, what is Bayes theorem? So now that this is gonna, um, I think it's uh, it's a lot to kind of take in, but I think if you understand the process, it'll help a whole lot. So, and I would actually suggest too, even after this thing, maybe go look at a YouTube video um, that says like, you know, uh, Bayes theorem or naive Bayes and see, you know, it's usually that I say is like, if they can draw it out, that's usually the best. It means that they're really taking the effort to make sure you can understand it visually. Okay. So we're gonna go right into this and I'm gonna go and share my screen and make sure this is all good there we go okay cool and so you guys can all see my screen all right oh you know what sorry guys i wanted to <laughs> i messed up i wanted to show this part a portion of my screen because then i can put the other my little notes sometimes just beside it or more like i put your guys' faces on the side so i can see if you guys look confused or giving me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, cool. So um, I have this, I don't think I have it pushed up to GitHub right now, but this will basically the notebook will be in GitHub. Um, so there's a few things that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so we're gonna actually look at doing Bayes theorem. And I'm gonna kind of like draw it out a little bit saying like how this process works um, for naive Bayes. Um, but the first thing I kind of wanted to show off is the, the very first section is MLE. Um, you guys remember MLE from yesterday, hopefully, um, with normal distributions. And so again, you know, 
lots of math. <laughs> and so it's definitely kind of like um, a little in your face kind of deal. But note that basically um, I wanted to kind of uh, put off is that this is what um, the curriculum calls the likelihood function. This is basically just calling a likelihood function. And this is a really classic formula that you'll see over and over again. Um, they very quickly say that um, one over M here is like, what's that number coming from? They basically just put that in there so it's easier to make derivatives. That's kind of like why they throw it in there because it's just a constant. And because remember, we're gonna do the arg max. Basically, we're trying to find the maximum value. Um, we're not looking for the actual value of it. Is that we can put in constants and not really worry about saying, well, we're putting in constants in here because all it, it's going to be the, if we scale everything up by three, that maximum value will still be the same. It's just the value of the function. It's just scaled up. That's what that one over M is basically just makes it simpler for us. Um, and then this L basically right here is our normal PDF function. And this basically is combined in here with to create um, what's it called our oops, I don't know why I put that in there. Anyway, um, basically it's to allow us to do that arg max to find the MLE. And usually we'll use Emily, um, that, that estimation, because it will assume independence and we don't have to worry about, you know, uh, math. But just know that you can do the same thing with math and get that same uh, proportion value. And it's just developing that mu value and the variance value from those equations. So I just kind of summarize it really quickly here just to show that's on there and just kind of show you. And note that um, whenever you see this proportional part, you guys have seen the symbol with the little like almost like a little fish. That just means proportional too. So note that some of the values, like it's like there should be some constants in there, maybe even constants that are related to an actual varying thing. But we can like, for example, um, if a value can vary, technically it's not a constant, but if we assume like certain things like independence, um, we can say, oh, well that's not gonna change because it's independent. So we can treat it like a constant. And that's why we can simplify these things very quickly. Okay, cool. And you can see this log. We, we love using log because log kind of transforms products into summations and then also exponents. You know, we can see here, this is, should be like E to the power. That's what the EXP stands for. That really just helps us um, just do the math more easily. Okay, cool. So just wanted to show that off um, and that will show up in the, the curriculum. So this kind of leads us, um, we're gonna use this mathematics basically to build a classification tool and stuff like that. So one thing we can do is, um, well, it's called supervised learning. So we haven't done any supervised learning before yet, um, but we have done something with linear regression. So do you guys recall like, um, like the whole point of our linear regression is we have our data. Sorry guys, <laughs> it's my dog. Um, but if we have our data points, right? We have our different data points I don't do great drawing dots even, but you would have something basically, you have a predicted model. So you can say, okay, when I input some value here, I predict that it will be at this value. And if I put an input right here, it will be at this value. So you can basically get like these values out of it. Well, supervised learning um, for class is mostly classification. And what this allows us is say, um, if we have a bunch of data points like this, and then maybe, for example, we have something like, oh, these are blue data points. I don't know if you guys can tell the difference between those two, but I'm kind of putting them more in the center. Okay. Um, and you say, hey, I want to separate these ones. I want to say what things are blue and what things are red. Uh, we can basically, if you were, you know, just looking at the values, we can actually draw lines around and say, okay, this right here, these are all blue, these are all red, and we can make these different kind of classifications, stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of like what supervised learning will be. And it's, it's different from our regression line and everything like that. So I'm gonna have to let my dog out, aren't I? Um, give me one second, guys. <laughs> I'm gonna run to the restroom while you do that. She just wanted to be part of it. She wanted to learn about naive things. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I know Paul's uh, stuck for, uh, for just for a second. Um, but again, one thing, um, and this is being recorded too, so that's why I'll just say it, is that um, classification or supervised learning is really useful, but it, it's really important in the sense that um, we have to know what our data 
represents. So like we have to know, for example, these points are red and these are blue. If we just have a bunch of points, we're like, oh, well, I think, you know, um, we have red points, blue points, and green points, but that wasn't recorded. Um, you can't do supervised learning. Okay. So the supervised part really is saying like um, supervised meaning that you know as like the experimenter what things are supposed to be classified as. So um, this is actually a big reason why when a lot of machine learning, we need good data. Um, this is why we have to like by hand classify, say, oh, this is a car. This is, you know, a bike. This is, you know, a cat. This is a dog. Someone has to go at some point actually classifying those things ahead of time so we can actually use it when we don't know what those parts are. Um, and that's the supervised part. Later on in mod, um, mod three, we'll do unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning is the opposite, where you don't know everything. So unsupervised would be closer to recommendation systems, um, where you know that people have certain tastes, but you don't know what those tastes are. Um, and again, because Paul just came in, uh, supervised learning is where you actually know how they're classified. Um, and then you're using those, those past classifications to determine new things. So two different methods, uh, but naive Bayes tends to be um, a really, uh, really fast, really simple way of classifying things, but it can be very powerful because it's so simple. Okay. So, um, oh, one thing I should note too is that compared to linear regression and um, supervised learning is that when we're doing classification, we don't classify to the degree of how class like what it is. So I put this example, this email is more spammy than this one, but they're both spam. So you can imagine you say like, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, I need some help. You mind sending like 50 bucks to me, you know, at this address versus, you know, maybe something that's all bold and blue and like, you know, like little HTML stuff is like, you know, buy now, you know, hurry before things are gone and there's misspellings. It looks more spammy, but classification doesn't care about how, what degree it is, it's just saying this is spam and it's not spam, okay? You can classify into sense, this is spam, not spam, and very spammy, but it doesn't say that degree. You have to put that in ahead of time. Doctors don't want you to know this one simple trick. Yeah, exactly. Right here. <laughs> it's kind of fun because it's like, it's like, oh, you as a person kind of know the idea, and it's kind of fun what we'll see is that we can actually put this in mathematical terms to represent these things. So these are all mathematical algorithms. And that's what kind of makes it, I think it's pretty cool. And we'll look at an NLP and um, more natural language processing, which we'll talk about in a sec too. Okay, so that's supervised learning. So now we have um, Bayes' theorem. So kind of a quick review on Bayes' theorem is that we have a few things. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but I wanted to say, you know, we're going to be looking at, for example, um, when A and R, so A and R and I'll put B as events, those things are, um, we're, when we see an and, basically we're saying, when these both happen, okay? And we'll actually use that to, um, I'll kind of diagram, put like what we learned last time, and we'll see where these values came out. So if you remember back from last time, this actually has a value with um, basically like, what's it? Uh, P of A times P of R such that A, you know, we would have something like that. And we actually see that in the diagram. Um, we also have the prior and the posterior, right? So to be honest, I always get these confused. I can't remember which one goes first in my head, um, which, you know, I don't know if it's the best thing, but you can kind of think it's like what the things we're looking for. So when you hear prior versus posterior, usually it's talking about what well, we're talking about Bayes' theorem and saying what thing we know ahead of time and then what we're trying to know. The posterior is the things like, I don't know, um, I don't know what this is, but the prior, I can measure this in some form or fashion, okay? So I'm gonna do a little, diagram right here. And so imagine if we have something, um, let's see here, I'll give an example. Okay. So we have some event that happens and it's either, let's say A, and I'm looking at my notes off the side here to make sure I don't mess it up for you guys, but um, A and B. So let's say for example, we'll just use the spam and not spam example. Okay. A is spam, B is not spam. Okay. Two different events. They're, in, they're independent in that sense. Okay. Or no, that's not a good example. Whatever. We'll just we'll keep it general. A and B. Okay. I don't want to mess you guys up. That's why. So we're gonna have two different events. So either A happens or B happens, right? And so we can actually say the probability of. Um, let me make sure I have this right. Yeah, we can actually say that like this comes out with a probability of A. And I have it 50/50 here, like you know visually, but it could obviously be you know 7, 70, you know 75, 20, 85 whatever, right? Basically, there's some value of PA and some value of PB, okay? So the probability of B, uh, PB happening, so B happens, 
the probability of A happening. So A happens, right? And then we want to see there's a third event, we'll call it R, all right? And we want to see, well, okay, when R happens or R doesn't happen. So in this case, we'll actually call it just R. And then the opposite of that, we'll usually say like R complement. Okay, and this is in, from section 21. We didn't talk about it last time, but it's in section 21. Uh, you also see someone say like not R, if you guys seen that notation, it's like a little dash. Sometimes in programming, they'll do something like a squiggle, R, okay, a tilde. So note that all these three things mean the same thing. Um, it's just kind of like what someone's mood essentially, <laughs> what they feel is useful. So I'll go to this, but I'll use um, R complement just to keep it consistent with uh, what we have in the curriculum. So you can think from A, so A happens, and you say, okay, either R happens, so I'll put it like here, or R doesn't happen, right? So two different possibilities, okay? Oops, there. And then the same thing can happen for B, either R happens or R doesn't happen. So note that essentially we're saying that R and A and B are independent of each other, right? They're not, they don't affect each other. Just because B doesn't happen doesn't mean R can't happen, okay? So we have these different events. And so this probability of this happening right here is the probability of R given that A happens. Makes sense, right? Because we can only get to this point right here if A happens, then R happens. And the same thing here, or similarly right here, the probability of R complement, not R, given that A happens, all right? So you can probably see what's this one gonna be, the probability of R given that B happens, the probability of not R given that um, B happens, okay? So hopefully at this point it's like, okay, nothing too fancy. Again, most probability just is kind of like, oh, it's not super complicated, it's just kind of hard to trace out everything that goes on. So. Now what happens is that we can actually talk about saying, well, this is basically the probability of um, R and A happening, right? And I'm not gonna write the other part, all of them out, but you can say the probability of not R, right? And A happening. And then this would be similarly, the probability of R and B happening, okay? And then uh, uh, there's a third one too, or the fourth one, but I'm not gonna write it because it takes me forever to write. So you can guys see the, the pathways going through here. And at the end, you are at one of these four pathways. There's not another thing you can land on, right? There's only this one, this one, this one, or this one. So if I were to add up all those probabilities, what should those probabilities add up to? One. 100. 100, right, 100%, 100 one. Usually we'll um, represent probability with point. So one is usually 100%, but yeah we're adding it up to one, that would be the whole thing. So the thing we're interested in though, is um, we want to find out is that what's the probability of R happening given A? So note that the problem, like, so if I write this down, I want to know the probability of R happening, I'm sorry, A happening given R. And so you notice that there's not really, there's no part in this whole thing that actually shows that. So we can actually get this out. So one thing we can kind of realize is that, <clears throat> excuse me, let me make sure I get my, my notes right, is that we can actually, um, sorry, we wanna say when R happens, how, how often is it A? So you'll notice that that basically just means is that I don't consider this position because R doesn't happen. I don't consider this position because R doesn't happen either, right? In this case, R does happen, and over here, R happens, but I only want to take basically the cases when this happens out of the total, okay? So you can kind of think of like these two parts now is my total sample space. That's all I care about, you know, that's my part. And so we'll actually normalize this to add up to one. But now we can say, okay, we can just follow this pathway. So the first thing is we have P of A happening and say, okay, when you get to here, so I'll just write this around. So we want this guy, P of A, we travel along, and then R happens, we have P R times A. So, and that's equal to this probability of R and A happening. So this is just equal to P of A times P of R given A. And hopefully you realize right there, like, oh wait, we've seen this before. This was conditional probability, okay? And you can just see that's the visual uh, transaction. So you can see if I go around through here, 
and then eventually I go here. So you can see that's my pathway right here. And then same thing right here, going in, can I use a different color? Yeah, black, nah, that's okay. So I can go this way, and this will give us P of B, P of R, given it, uh, B, okay? So those are our two probabilities. And what's nice is that you can see right here is that, hey, we actually know all of these things. We know this one, we know this one, we know this one, we know this one. Basically the idea is that every point we split off, we actually know these values. And we can measure these, for example, like, like oh, the probability of A happening is 0.75, probability of R happening is you know so, so often, so you can see how often this splits off right? Because this will add up to 100%. So we can measure all these things or know them ahead of time. So now we have these values. And now we still wanted to get this guy right here. And so this guy right here is basically saying, if we write this in more formal parts, right? It's basically saying, okay, P of R and um, A happening over all the possible um, parts, which is P of R and A plus P of R and B. And you can see now it's like, okay, cool. Like this is actually what we want. We have all these pieces. Now we can just have to plug it in. So just getting this part, if I were to write it out, so I'm just gonna, can I move it? Yeah. So if I wanted to just write this part out now and it's full glory, is I can say, okay, that means P of A given R, which is what we want, which we didn't originally know is equal to P of A times P of R, <laughs> ah, dang, whatever, you guys get it, given A all over this whole mess again. I'm just gonna write it because I'm lazy. Okay, so P of A times P of R given A, and then this part right here. So I'll just kind of say like this this whole thing, okay? And basically that's just, um, you can actually think of this just being a part of P of E and stuff like that, but this is actually Bayes' theorem. Like we just essentially re-derive Bayes' theorem from this part. And this is when we talk about Bayes' theorem, that's what we're doing. We're basically just traveling along the lines and saying, when does this other event, in this case like R, doesn't happen? Sometimes you also see like A and then not A, you know? And then this would be like event B, same idea. But the point is, is that uh, we are looking for multiple events, basically these events, and we add up this sum in here. And we're, basically we do this part um, to add it up is because we're normalizing. We're saying only these two things are possible. So that's why this will always, this um, P A such that R and P um, B such that R, okay? Those should add up to one, essentially. That's what we're doing, okay? So any questions on thing that are graphed out kind of thing? And the reason I'm showing you this is because I kind of want to show you guys what naive Bayes looks like, or, or sorry, Bayes theorem looks like before we jump into naive Bayes. Okay, cool. Thumbs up, thumbs down, sideways. Okay, cool, awesome. So I'll just go ahead and clear this out so I can use it again. Okay, so going back to here though, um, now we have those parts. So you can see right here, we had the P, um, what's it called? Uh, the prior, right? P-R-A, and then P A given R, and that was the things that we were looking for, right? And so we can actually find all these parts. So this is like, cool, we can get this. Um, a classic example, I would look this up. I actually think I might have, I might have made a video early, early on about doing Bayes theorem on sickness. So if you go on the channel, I think like on the YouTube channel, you can like go to the first video. I think that's the first one I have. Um, but basically it's describing just that, but specifically for sickness. But you can imagine, for example, instead of A, B and R, you can instead say, okay, um, you go in and you go in and you get a test of saying whether you're sick or not for this disease. And basically it's either a positive test or a positive result or a negative result. But there's also probability that you're actually sick versus not sick. And so basically if you tested positive, you have to say, well, okay, how likely am I actually, you know, sick? And it turns out if you have a very, um, what's it called? Uh, un if you have a very uncommon disease, you actually are not very likely to, even though you test positive, it's got like a really low chance of you actually being sick. And this is actually one big issue when you have, basically it's like a false negative, right? Or sorry, false positive. And so these are the kind of things that you can kind of think of like, oh, even if the test is super, super accurate, um, if the test is 
um, or sorry, the disease is very, very rare, it just means that you're more likely to get false positives. So in this scenario, if we think about like what our A, B, and RC is, we can think of um, just kind of drawing it out. Our A basically, why can't I draw? <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, we can think of our A is if you're sick, B being you're not sick, so you're healthy. And then you can think of like R as like the tests being like you're tested positive. Okay, doesn't mean you're necessarily sick or healthy, you know, but you just say, oh, you're positive for the disease, right? So in the end, we wanna say, hey, how likely am I actually healthy given that I tested positive? Okay, and that's the kind of stuff we're looking for. And it's just the same exact pathways that I showed. So this is how you can use Bayes theorem to kind of figure this part out. So it's good, you can calculate you know, the percentage. So what's nice about that naive base, um, when we do naive base as a classification classifier, we can actually use this idea, this I example of finding the probability to actually classify saying how likely, or not how likely, but if this thing is likely spam or if this thing is likely um, not spam or you know whatever two things you wanna uh, compare and stuff like that. And it turns out, um, the reason why spam is used at this for a lot is because I don't know if you guys remember, but spam used to be really, really bad. Like, um, I think you guys probably like, if you remember back, like when you first got your email, that was like the main thing. You would get spam constantly and it just was ridiculous and everything like that. And it turns out, um, if you notice now, we pretty decent at like, if you have an email client, it's pretty decent at like finding out spam. Like I don't see spam very often. I don't know about you guys. I use mostly like Gmail, for example, but like, I never see spam. And I remember like back like when I had AOL, it was just like awful. <laughs> it's like every, like, it was like one, one out of five emails weren't spam. And it was just like ridiculous. Um, and we had to market as spam and just never did anything. But it turned out um, we, most of these, I mean, we have other advanced methods, but a big uh, jump in spam detection was naive Bayes classifier. And so that's kind of why you see a lot of people talk uh, naive Bayes using spam, okay? Um, and again, it's a form of supervised learning. So as I mentioned before, you have to know what spam is and what's not spam ahead of time. You have to know it, know it right? And that's kind of like, uh, they did have a database in this sense because people kept marking a spam. And you know, people went through a lot of emails saying what spam looks like, you know, what that goes through. Um, now we have more advanced methods. So even as spammers try to like adjust their algorithm and stuff like that, or like adjust their method of writing spam, um, you can start catching those things. But the point is that for naive base classifier to work, you have to know ahead of time what your data is gonna look like, what does spam look like and what spam doesn't look like. Okay, cool. So this kind of goes into our whole thing, but our first thing we need to talk about is this naive assumption. And this is like why it's called naive base. And so the first assumption basically is that um, A and B is equal to PA times PB. And then note that this only is true when we have, um, what's it called? when it's independent. And that's actually like for most things, like I said before, things are not technically independent. Like you might say, for example, let's say um, if the words in there are like money and um, like to say that it's spam, like, oh, it has the word money. It has a, like, it has a more chance of being spam and then having something like, I don't know. <laughs> I trying to think something I would write in spam, um, like now or something like that, right? And so you say, oh, like maybe for example, cash now has a higher likelihood for being spam. You know, you really wouldn't, like you would have these things together, like they can affect each other. It's like, you know, what? we're just gonna ignore that. And it turns out it's a very naive thing. It's like, oh, everything's independent of each other. And we actually don't know that is. And it turns out most things are not independent, but because we're doing this on a large data set and um, just the nature of like the central uh, limit theorem, we can make this assumption and it works pretty well. So it's kind of a cool thing. So again, that's where the naive part comes of, of naive Bayes. We're basically assuming things are independent of each other, okay? And then you'll remember um, uh, us from um, conditional probability, we can do this right here, okay? Basically, probability of A such B because they are independent now in this part. And what we'll do, you'll notice that when, instead of writing this part out, we're just gonna cheat, and just like write this part because it's simpler. We don't have to worry about this B. And usually it's because we, the B cancels out. It's just a factor. We're going to normalize at the very end, like I showed before. So if we have an extra factor and we have to normalize, we're just going to divide by essentially a PB times something else. So that's usually why you'll see this part is completely ignored. This makes our life easier. So we don't even need to know what PB is. We've seen it on this part right here. Okay. So it's kind of a couple of things that we're going in for uh, naive base. I have to kind of step into it. 
So now we can actually go into like what this classification looks like. So I kind of have a little, okay, a little scenario here, right? So imagine is that we're trying to figure out if something is spam or the opposite ham, right? It's like it's good emails versus bad emails. And we're gonna use it by only a couple words, like buy and cash. So those are kind of like spammy words. We're like, okay, like I think those ones are things that we should look at, check it out, right? And say, so, okay, what's the probability of it being spam given that it has the word buy and cash in here, okay? And so we can actually find this, this comes directly from the proportional. Say, okay, well that is proportional to the probability of spam times the probability of buy and cash such that it's spam. And I do the same thing for ham down here, but the same idea. So note that that kind of flip over here. I'm saying, I'm looking at, I wanna know how likely is this thing spam if I have these words, right? Um, and instead I can use the fact that saying, well, how many spam, how much spam has buy and cash in it? And then also find out the probability of how often spam happens. So the way you would actually get this in the real world is that you basically would have something called a corpus, basically a huge amount of data. Um, you know, maybe like a corpus usually means words, but like you have a huge amount of data and you say, you know, it's spam or it's not spam. And you just look at how often, you know, how often does spam have the words buy in it? How often does the uh, spam, how often does spam have the words cash in it? And you can see that percentage and you can do the same thing for hand and saying, okay, how frequently this happens. So you can get these values right here and right here pretty easily. But um, what's kind of nice is that we can actually use the naive assumption to split this part. Because note that this is buy and cash. When you see this comma, you could just easily have put and. So buy and cash, just know that comma is the same thing, okay? So we can actually use the naive assumption to split this up, all right? And so what I mean by that is that if I have the probability of, let's say, buy, and I'll put it like this, and uh, cash, given it's spam, I can just simply look at the conditional probability right here. So it's kind of nice, you can kind of split this part up. You can basically, uh, sorry, I have this right, yeah. You can basically split this part up so you can consider just buy by itself and just spam by itself. So you can think of something like probability of buy given, oops, sorry guys. Uh, given it's spam. So basically, I'm not gonna write the whole thing out because you can derive this part and it's just in the curriculum. But basically, you can get this part, which is what you want. Because now we say, hey, I don't need to consider both words. I can just consider one word for my spam. And you can do this, for example, if you have like 40 different words that are all related to spam, I can now split them up into these parts and they'll just be multiplied together. And that makes it easier for us to actually do the calculation and everything like that. So it's like, cool, we use a, a naive assumptions to split up our parts as needed, okay? So once we have that, we'll have this big old uh, equation basically. And it ends up being, sorry. We can actually take this guy right here and figure out this, this is proportional to, and then we'll have this long thing of like probability of buy such as spam, such as this, such as spam, blah, 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 blah. But the important part is that we also have to know how often this happens for ham, right? And so it's like, we're basically doing that tree and we're just looking at the points like, okay, like this is when it's ham, this is when it's A, this is when it's um, spam, this is when it's B. Okay, and then R is essentially was this word right here. Or in this case, we might have multiple R's. You know, we'll have like R, S, T, you know, whatever, right? Going all the way through. And we just follow that tree through and we say, okay, let's just go ahead and add up basically. If we want to see the probability of it being not spam, such that it has the words buy and cash in it, we have to just do this part right here, which we can split up, you know, using a uh, conditional probability. Um, and we can use this part right here, do the same exact thing add up basically all the possibilities and we get it, this is to normalize it. And then that gives us the full probability of how often it's actually ham, um, given that it's bought, such that, such that there has the words buy and cash in it, okay? And this is essentially what you'll do when you write out the, what's it called? The, um, when you're writing out the code and working through it, you will do something, you know, we'll talk about this in a second, but we'll tokenize it, basically count the frequency. You basically count how often do these words come up within this certain context. So how often does the words buy occur given that it's spam, okay, or ham or whatever it is, okay? So to get it summarized on here, I kind of wrote this little part so you can kind of, why can't I click on here? There we go, okay. Okay, 
sorry guys, there we go. Okay, so I basically just wrote this little quick summary and this is kind of like procedurally what you're doing. Note that um, this isn't written anywhere in the curriculum, but this is essentially what you're doing when you do naive Bayes, okay? You get a list of words and can you guys see this okay? It's not too small. Okay. Um, you basically get a list of words that you know that are known to be spam or ham. I should say list of like emails, right? So like a list of emails. Okay. And in those emails, basically there's words, right? That are saying, oh, either it's spam or ham, right? And then basically we write out this equation for each word say, okay, probability of it being spam such that this word, this word, this word, this word, this word. So you could technically do this for every single word that's possible in this like whole collection of emails, but you probably take the most common ones, you know, or at least the ones that you probably would say stick out. You could do it for larger things, but again, this is how you would kind of apply this. So you say, okay, you write this part out, and then we use Bayes theorem to get the proportional part, which was up here. So I kind of wrote this out for you. So we get this part, and then we use a naive Bayes um, to, assumption to split it. And we actually use that independence part right here. So PA, PB, right? We can get those parts and basically split them up. And when we split them up that way, now we can say, ah, cool. Like I just need to look at saying uh, the probability of it being um, ham given that it's, um, sorry, the probability of it being ham given that it has the words by cash, or sorry. Oh, you know, I just realized I had a little typo guys. Did you notice that? <laughs> um, I'm looking at this guy in this front of here. This is what we're trying to find, right? But this one's the opposite. It should actually be by cash given ham. So it should look like this. You can see how much I have to write just to write these kind of things. It should be like this. Okay, so because we know we know what this is, right? We don't know the opposite. We don't know if it's ham versus this. And the same thing right here. I messed this up. This should be flipped over. Okay, but you guys get the point. Um, but once we have those parts, we have the basically nice assumption. We break it down and we say, okay, basically how frequently does this happen? We plug those numbers in. We get the normalization, and that gives us the probability of this specific email with these words in it are actually ham or spam. Okay, so. That's the overview of like what this looks like. Obviously, we didn't write any code, but this gives you an idea of what we're doing as you write that code. So any questions on how this works or why this works or what were you doing, Victor? Cool. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Cool. Okay, sideways. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this is something like I think um, I'm trying to think of there's a good resource. I'll try to send it out maybe. Um, but I would say a, a good resource is to look up, just say, look on YouTube to say naive Bayes um, drawn out because that will usually kind of be a pretty example of like these parts. But basically you can kind of think of it the whole thing. It says they're just drawing that tree diagram and you're just picking up the parts of the tree. And at the very end, you only have parts of the tree. So you have to normalize it. And that's what this is right here. It's just normalizing all the possibilities. Okay. Uh, this normally would be very long because you'd have to split this up with the naive assumption basically that there's, they're independent. So cool. And again, this should be flipped over, but I'm not going to go in there right now and flip it. I'll fix it in um, the final version. Okay. So cool. Um, so this kind of finished up for naive days, but now we say, okay, that's cool, but how do we actually do this part? And we actually can use something called um, NLP. And so I'm actually going to use this one so I can write it. So NLP, which just stands for Natural Language Processing. Okay, which is the, kind of the second half of the curriculum for this section, um, is basically how do we get the words into some mathematical entity so we can actually do probability and quickly use stuff with it. So this is word vectorization, and basically we're turning words into numbers. For, you know, And depending on what you're doing, um, NLP can be very intensive. <laughs> um, it can get very large, obviously. Um, languages are different too. For example, we'll talk mostly about English, um, because you know we're in the U.S., so like it's easier to talk about English. Um, but note that depending on the different languages, you might have different processes that you have to do. Um, in fact, it kind of helps. Uh, for example, do you guys know a second language by chance? Okay, kind of. <laughs> uh, Spanish, French, German. Spanish. Spanish. Joe, do you have what's your second? That's kind of. <laughs> uh, Spanish. Spanish, okay. So those ones, thankfully, um, they usually have very similar syntax and grammar as English, the romantic languages. Um, 
and even Germanic. But um, you'll have other languages, for example, I don't know any, I don't know specifically like Finnish or um, Mandarin. They have a different syntactical structure, which means you have to apply different techniques. But just know this is the general thing for English. Um, fun fact, American Sign Language has a very similar syntax to Mandarin, um, which is kind of funny when I read these things when we process it, it reads very much like how you would, um, something called glossing for sign language. But that's not, that's not something we're talking about, so don't worry about it. Um, the main thing you're going to talk about is in the curriculum, we'll say there's this thing called a corpus, bag of words, and then vectorization. So I wanted to point these things out. So a corpus is basically just a collection of just like words. So you can think of like a book could be a corpus. It could be a bunch of documents. It could be a bunch of emails is your corpus. Basically, it's your huge amount of like word data. Okay. So this is kind of what you're working off of. And then what we do is basically create this thing called bag of words. And what that literally just means is essentially you're creating a dictionary saying how often does this specific word occur. Note that we don't care about, at least for so, some NLP, we have to care about, you know, order. And those are like Markov chains and stuff like that. But for something like naive Bayes, we don't care about order. We're just looking at just what kind of words happen. And that's why, you know, it's a really simple algorithm, but it's really powerful in this way because we can apply it very, very quickly. So basically we go through the whole corpus and just count how often does span or the word money happen or cash happen, or, you know, something along those lines, Nigerian prints, you know, like whatever, right? Like you kind of count all those different words that come through. And so um, we can do this basically, you know, you can kind of think how you would do this. You might do, for example, get the whole, like, you know, say it's a book, take the whole book, split it up by like um, spaces, right? So now we got all these words, um, but then you might, what are some issues with that? Once we split up the spaces, uh, we won't be done, right? So what are some things that you might come across? Punctuation. Punctuation, right? If you have a dot or a period, exclamation point, question mark, those would be counted as different words now because they're not all the same. What other things might we see? Plurality. Plurals, right? If it's plural or not, stuff like that. So if you have like ponies versus pony, or if you have friends versus friend, you know, those would be considered different words. Anything else you might see? Prefix, suffix. Prefix, suffix, good. Okay. So like maybe not root words, right? Um, anything else? Um, do you guys can think of? Possessives, but it, that's punctuation too, sort of. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. It's both mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, another thing is capitalization. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can start thinking about, like, oh, how these different things can get split up. Um, also, if like the words like, you know, boring versus bored, you know, like those might be considered the same word. They have the same context. Yeah. yeah. So this is, these are all the things you think about when you're doing NLP. And basically the idea is we'll create a vector and there's a couple ways you can do vectorization. One is basically the simplest way, which is I think what you guys will do in the, the labs, is basically just see how frequently it happens. So if the word occurs 20 times in the whole corpus, that vector is essentially 20. So it's kind of like that simple. Um, there's more advanced ways you can do it. And it mentions about in the curriculum, one of the other ways, I can't remember what, what it was, but there's another way you could do it too, with the, basically with frequency. But that's kind of like what it's related to, okay? Um, so again, English are hard. So obviously that's not really like correct grammar, but basically a lot of tokenization, bird vectorization, we don't really care about grammar. I mean, we shouldn't say we couldn't care, but like, for example, tenses, for example, um, words that are changed over like are, is, be, like those things, those are basically the same word, just different forms of it. For example, being bored versus I am bored or I am, you know, it is boring. like those are the same context and stuff. So we want to kind of simplify that. like you guys had talked about. So there's basically like three main parts and there's more stuff too. For example, parts of speech that we're not going to talk about right now, but um, stemming. So stemming is kind of like the really fast crude, like let's just get this done kind of thing. And it's very fast because we don't have to do very much. Basically you just cut off the extra parts. So if it's like, oh, for that example, if the word is, you know, friend versus friends, we just take off the S. We're just like, whatever, just take off S's. It's like ing, take off ing. Ed, take off ed. So you'll get words like, it's kind of funny actually, but you'll get something like, for example, um, like bored. We'll just go ahead and get rid of ed. And like boring, we'll just get rid of ing. And you notice like, well, those aren't real words. We don't care if they're real words. We just care about if it's the same token. So that's where this tokenize, or tokenizing thing. We're saying these are all the same thing, so we're going to treat them the same. Um, other things too, though, to know is that, for example, like, I think the curriculum shows like ponies. 
that will be simplified to uh, like pony with an I or something like that if you try to tokenize this. So note that this isn't a real word and stuff like that too. And then that's different from pony, right? So there's some limitations in like using stemming because pony is not the same thing, like won't be abbreviated the same way, won't be the same token. Um, depending on what the package is, uh, NLTK, I don't think we use it in this case for um, the lab because you don't need it really. It's a pretty simple one. But NLTK is a really popular package that does a lot of this like stemming and later we'll talk about lim limitization, uh, basically lemming. And um, basically, basically it has a lot of these tools built in so you don't have to do it yourself. Okay, But um, that's something to look at. But again, stemming basically is this really fast, quick way to do things. It's crude, it doesn't make real words. Sometimes the words don't actually match up like pony and ponies, but for the most part, it tends to do a pretty decent job, especially if you're just going through it really quickly, okay? The next part is a little more advanced, which means it's gonna be more memory intensive, called limit limitization. And this is closer to saying, oh, the word is, are, be, you know, these things should all be related to each other. These should all be basically the same word. Or if I had something like ponies and pony, it realizes, oh, these should both be pony. Like they're, they should be treated the same. So this is really good, for example, if you have something that's um, an irregular plural. So like, you know, usually we just add S in English, right, at the very end. But in some cases you might have to, you know, depending what like your plural, I can't think of a good example for a plural that would do this, but you might modify um, modify the whole word. And this kind of means that they'll look for words in English that are specific saying, I'm trying to think of a good example. I can't think of anything, but um, like, oh, like cactus and cacti. Cactus and cacti are completely different, you know, looking words. And I just cut off the, at, you know, there's no S in there and stuff like that. Um, so basically it'll realize, oh, cacti and cactus are really the same word, the same morphology. We'll go ahead and keep those the same. Okay, so that's really what limitization is. So it's more powerful. It's more like flexible in that way, but it can be more memory intensive because it has to use basically a dictionary. It has to know what these words are connected to. It's, it doesn't inherently know that is and R and B. It has to be told is R and B are all the same words and we're gonna treat them as such. So you end up getting these things where it's like, um, well, okay, we'll go to the next part, but that's the next step. That's another step you can do, okay? The next one is stop words. So stop words are things like of, the, and, a, you know, things like that. Basically words that we don't really care about. They don't give that much more information for what we're looking at. Um, if you're looking for more for like, you know, um, order and stuff like that, it, they could be important. But for the most part, they're not really getting extra information that we care about, okay? So for the most part, we just basically get rid of stop words. And we're just saying, oh, we don't really care. A comes up a lot, they comes up, or the comes up a lot. It's not giving extra information that could be useful. And we'll get rid of that. So your sentence, for example, like um, the uppies are cool, okay? This would might be reduced, for example, like if you're doing like, you know, stemming, lemonization, um, getting rid of stop words, it would basically say puppies, when you say puppies, it's puppy, cool, and anyway, I change it to like puppy. That'd be cool. It's kind of like what it summarize that whole thing in there. And so this kind of gives us a lot of, um, gets rid of a lot of extra information that we don't really need to care about, it reduces the words and makes things that are, you know, if we look at puppy and puppies, now we can actually look at those two parts and say, oh, those are the same thing. So that's kind of like the basics of NLP. And that's what you would do, for example, if you wanted to make your own spam classifier, you take your corpus of email data, do stemming, do lemonization, basically you're tokenizing the words, making it to a bag of words. Okay, cool. So um, any questions on this stuff? Um, yeah, cool. And note that there's more stuff you can do for NLP. Um, for example, parts of speech. But since we're not looking at anything too complicated, we're not gonna do that right, right now. Um, in future lessons, we'll talk about that. But um, just know that there's other techniques you can do for NLP that can make it obviously more complicated. Um, NLP is probably a huge, like, it's probably like the, the biggest thing right now where we're doing really great progress, but there's so much to do. So you guys probably know the joke. Um, like you guys probably remember when voice recognition was really awful and like people would like never be able to say anything to, you know, this stuff. It'd just be a joke. Like this is this is completely pointless. Um, obviously now we have things like Google Home, Amazon Echo. Um, you can say Siri too. Um, but like 
a lot of these things, um, they have a lot better of doing this natural language processing, detecting it. Um, and note, um, one thing you might notice as a data scientist too, data is king. Um, the more data you have, the better your system's gonna be. And that's one of the reasons why if you kind of do like a blind test comparison, like how well they translate, it tends to be, you know, for example, Google tends to be very quite good compared to something like Siri. And one of the reasons why, at least as of right now, is that you need a lot of data um, and accessible data in order to improve your models and stuff like that. Now there are other techniques you can do, which is what Apple's doing with Siri. But obviously if you have a small amount of data, it's just hard to do any training. Okay, cool guys. Well, that kind of finishes up what I had to say. Do you guys have any questions about either NLP, um, anything I talked about for word factorization? Sure, I will in the future, but <laughs> yeah. you know, taking it in. Yeah, this is, this is one of my favorite stuff is NLP. Um, I, I, I always say is like, if I could go back in the past, I'd go like go study linguistics. Like there's so much. And so the languages are so differing. Um, kind of fun thing like um, NLP, you'll see a lot of the research done on English, which means that there's a lot of languages that are not um, accounted for. And that's actually one of the reasons why, you know, for example, you look at like Mandarin, for example, and you see, you know, like how they do NLP for that. Um, there's, you have to, apply a different kind of uh, some, some different concepts and stuff like that. And that it doesn't apply in the same way as English. Um, one thing I'm, I'm most curious about is things like um, American Sign Language. American Sign Language, um, first of all, it's a visual language. So it's kind of hard to actually get like data where it's like written down. So that's obviously very different. Um, usually the technique for doing this stuff or recognition is that you detect the speech and then use that speech detection write those into words and then make your bag of words from that. Um, usually that's the easier way. And then there's other more advanced things you can do with NLP, but yeah, cool. But anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so one last thing again, I talked about a lot of like Bayes theorem. Um, there's a lot more than that in the curriculum, but that's your ultimate goal in that Bayes theorem. Like at the end, you're gonna be doing a few Bayes, um, naive Bayes classifiers and implementing it. So I wanted to show you what that looks like and what that process is. Okay, cool. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop recording now because I think we're all set, right? No other questions right now? Nope. All right. Cool. Uh,